Hello, I'm John Hammontree, and this is The Reckon Interview Live. And today we are chatting with Congresswoman, uh, I nearly called you John Lewis, uh, Terry Sewell, about the legacy of John Lewis. Congresswoman Sewell, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for having me. It's been a very long but very great uh, farewell for uh, an American hero and an Alabama treasure, John Lewis. Well, I know that it's been a, a draining but also uplifting process, I, I'm sure for you as well as for the country. I'm curious what your first memory of John Lewis is and when you first met him. So my first memories of John Lewis are growing up in Selma and as a member, a life member of Brown Chapel, the historic Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma. Um, you know, like most families, my family has a certain pew that we sit in um, on Sundays and Growing up uh, every year, year after year, those foot soldiers, John Lewis, uh, um, F.D. Reese, um, Joseph Lowry, C.T. Vivian, Coretta Scott King, they would all come back uh, that first Sunday in the month of March to recommemorate Bloody Sunday, to make sure that this nation never forgot, to be inspired uh, by their act of civic engagement that led to um, the equal right to vote in America for African Americans. And so my earliest memories of John are as a little child, I used to sing in the children's choir. And then as I would grow up, I was an usher. And so I would always see the, these wonderful foot soldiers. And so, you know, the, the legend of John Lewis, um, the boy from Troy growing up uh, in Troy, Alabama from humble means and having the, the, the audacity at the age of 25 to stand up to Alabama state troopers and to lead that march of 600 people, to be bludgeoned on a bridge, uh, but ultimately to be triumphant in the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The, the legend of John Lewis was as familiar to me growing up as any Bible verse or family lore. I think the very first time that I can remember meeting him was as um, a teenager, um, Cheyenne Webb Kreisberg, who's from Montgomery, who was the age of eight. She was one of the youngest foot soldiers back in the night in 65 crossing that bridge. Um, you know, when you grow up in Selma, a small town, these uh, iconic civil rights uh, foot soldiers become your babysitter. She was my babysitter growing up. She uh, was a cheerleader at Amazing. Selma High School and my dad was a high school basketball coach. And so Cheyenne Webb introduced me to, to John Lewis as a as a teenager uh, on one of those bridge crossings. And so, you know, like I said, growing up uh, you uh, in Selma, you have a unique perspective um, of the importance of foot soldiers like John Lewis, but never in a million years, John, did I think I would grow up and be elected Alabama's first black Congresswoman to be from Selma, to be from Brown Chapel AME Church. I don't know if you believe in divine intervention. I do. Um, and, I, it, I've had so many pinch me moments with John Lewis, but perhaps the most iconic was welcoming the world uh, to Selma, Alabama on the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, of that, Sunday, of that Selma to Montgomery March. It was a beautiful um, March 7th, 2015. I'll never forget it because I got an opportunity to sit on that stage with not one president, but two presidents, President Bush, Laura and uh, George W. Bush came back because you know, voting rights used to not be partisan. Right. Um, President Bush uh, in 2006, he signed the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. And but for the Supreme Court decision in Shelby versus Holder, we would still be living under the full protections of federal oversight um, for states that have had a, had a, a history of voter discrimination. Um, we would still be living under the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. So. There's not a memory that I have of Bloody Sunday and the reenactment in my home church that, de that doesn't include John Lewis. And um, to grow up and, and to have the honor of meeting my hero and befriending him. And then, uh, you know, he led a delegation year after year, uh, a bipartisan delegation of Republicans and Democrats, only John, to um, Alabama uh, to walk in his footsteps. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've had the great honor of co-hosting that delegation, Faith and Politics Pilgrimage with John Lewis. And it was just one of the highlights of my life. Well, and you, you mentioned he is known as the boy from Troy. And I was also struck in the last couple of weeks about just how many 
places kind of claim uh, John Lewis as one of their own. Obviously, Alabama does uh, both Troy and Selma, uh, Montgomery, uh, Nashville, Atlanta, obviously, Washington, D.C., of course. Uh, and, and his impact has been has been global. But, you know, you represent the district, as you said, that that is home to Selma. Um, what is I mean, beyond beyond voting rights, what is his long term legacy for your community and for the state? You know, John um, was the living embodiment of the triumph of love over hate. Given that John was bludgeoned on that bridge, you would think that he would be bitter, but he always uh, exuded love. He radiated love. He believed very fervently that um, we should strive um, for that beloved community. He believed in the innate goodness of every human being. And he appealed to that goodness. Um, and so when I think of John's legacy, yes, it's a legacy that's uh, civil rights and human rights and voting rights, clearly. But it is also a legacy of how to treat human beings. He was one of these persons that just, um, you know, he, he led by example. You couldn't walk with John two feet without having someone come up to him and ask for an autograph or a photo. And John always took time. He would pause and look that person in the eye and call that person my brother, my sister. And he meant it. Like John was um, just a very special human being. And I was just so honored to have a very special connection with him um, because of the connection to Selma. Um, I, you know... I was honored not only to call him friend, but he was a wonderful mentor. He took the opportunity whenever he was talking about civil rights. And if I was anywhere in the room, if it was on stage in front of a big crowd, he would say, and Terry Sewell represents Selma today. And he would he would say it almost like a proud father. And yet I was the one who was so, um, so honored by his benevolence, his willingness to share that platform, to always bring me along as if he knew that he was, you know, that he needed to pour those, sow those seeds of hope and inspiration into another generation so that we can continue his march towards that more beloved community. And, you know, I, um, I was just so proud of the state of Alabama that we gave him a real hero's welcome. Uh, and while there are lots of states that claim him clearly uh, Alabama and Georgia have the most claim on him. He served for 34 years as the representative of Atlanta and the fifth district of Georgia, but he will always be Alabama's native son. And I was just so proud uh, to work with our governor and our state leaders that, that uh, we all um, saw that it was befitting that John would be able to lie in state in Alabama's uh, state capital. He was the first African-American to do so. And wow. uh, in fact, the last person to lie in state in Montgomery was George Wallace and uh, when he passed. So what an amazing bookend to have George Wallace and uh, John Lewis be given that, that honor. We do have a quick comment from Latoya Osborne. Uh, she says, we are tremendously honored to claim John Lewis. We're equally proud to have leaders like Representative Terry Sewell continuing to follow in his footsteps. She inspires future leaders like myself. Uh, this is a quick opportunity to remind everybody that this is an interactive show. So if you do have questions for Congresswoman Sewell, please leave them in the comments and we'll try to answer them as best we can. Thank you, LaToya. Yes, LaToya, thank you. Listen, you know, John left a legacy for all of us to follow. And, you know, I often feel, um, you know, I was deeply struck as a, as at yesterday's funeral services when President Barack Obama was just reminding us all of John's, you know, importance to all of us, that we all have a role to play in honoring him. Yes, Congress uh, needs to re uh, reestablish and restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act that was struck down by that Shelby versus Holder, but every citizen uh, can honor John by remembering to vote in every election, state, local, and federal. So we all have our role to play. And, you know, I just, um, I, I was just so moved by how many people and, and just the fact that John actually, towards the end of his life, um, stricken with cancer, came back to Selma mm -hmm. for the fifth anniversary just this past March. And he really did give us the roadmap. 
He told us never be bitter, never be hostile. Um, he told us to keep our eyes on the prize and he told us to never give up. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I, when I'm feeling low and sad, I have to remember that John lived for 80 years and he made the best of those 80 years. And he really has changed the landscape of America. Um, and he teaches us that young people, uh, he was only 25 years old. Right. But, you know, when you think about John in that backpack, and I don't know if you can see, I'm in my Washington DC office. And perhaps one of the biggest things that I will cherish for the rest of my life is John gave me a signed copy of the Life um, magazine uh, of the, of the uh, you know, from March 1965 of that March. And he signed it, it's right there. Yeah. And, um, right behind me. And so um, well, I, was, I was moved by the fact that when I went to the Oval Office to visit President Obama, um, the last time I went to visit him before he left office, um, he had one of those that John had given him as a senator. So John has sowed a lot of seeds and, you know, uh, there's great expectations that all of us will honor his legacy by remembering that we too can continue his march towards a more perfect union. There are two um, things that are currently being considered. I mean, it, it, there will be countless uh, memories and legacies to John Lewis that we've seen schools that are already starting to change their name. I'm sure we will see roads and statues and, and more, but two things that are currently being hotly debated uh, are the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which I understand has now already changed its name, yeah, and the we, Edmund Pettus Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> we changed so the name of H.R. 4, which passed the House of Representatives, is sitting on the Senate desk, but we passed by acclamation to change the name of H.R. 4 to the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Act of 2020. And we just hope that uh, you all will call your senators and make sure that they, <laughs> that they ask Mitch McConnell to take it off his desk and pass it right now. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's in it. Um, I, I'm not sure that the average person necessarily knows what Shelby V. Holder did. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we see these iconic imagery, imagery from Selma and we think, okay, you know, uh, John Lewis and, and the Courage Courageous Eight and others, they won the rights to vote and that's, that's it, end of story. So why is this uh, John Lewis Act even needed? What, what, what is in it? So um, what the Supreme Court did in 2013 is that they, they found unconstitutional um, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. And Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act was um, what Congress uh, passed as um, the formula to determine which states have had a history of voter discrimination such that Section 5, uh, federal preclearance, was required in order for that state to make any changes to voting laws. So if you will remember, there were 16 covered jurisdictions and those covered jurisdictions were determined by Congress under Section 4. So what the Supreme Court said is that we were um, discriminating against states like Alabama for prior bad acts in the 1950s and the 1960s, that if Congress wanted to reinstate or restore federal protection, Section 5, that they needed to come up with a new Section 4. So H.R. 4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, comes up with a modern day formula for determining which states need to have preclearance. And that modern day formula is a 25 year look back. So 1995 going forward, it is if a state has had uh, 10 or more adjudicated violations of voter discrimination, then that state would have to pre-clear any, uh, any future changes to their voting laws. And believe it or not, uh, there have been 11 states that have had uh, that, including Alabama. We, you know, we're under a consent decree and some other things. And this is like not, not this is not the 1960s or 19, you know, 50s. This is 1990s going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we found after the Holder decision, a lot of states like Alabama changed their uh, laws uh, it, with, with respect to voting. It used to be that Alabama in Alabama, you could vote. Of course, you need to show an ID to show who you are. No one's ever disputed that. Let me just say that. It's the type of IDs. It's a type of restrictive, um, making it harder for people to vote 
um, when you when you're making it harder for people to vote, that's what's really uh, the problem. And the state of Alabama used to make it okay uh, if you had you had to have 15, there were 15 forms of IDs that you could show, including my dad having been a stroke victim. He was voting with a validly issued federal ID called a Social Security card. Mm -hmm. The last time I checked, Social Security card didn't require a photo. But all of a sudden, Alabama, like a lot of other states, 33 other states, went in and changed their voting laws by adding additional requirements. The state of Alabama during this pandemic, why are we requiring two uh, signatures for an absentee, two witnesses to an absentee ballot? Isn't it enough that we're requiring an ID uh, to be mailed in? Even that in, during a pandemic is hard. When you're asking people you're safer at home to have to go and make a photocopy of your ID to insert in your application for an absentee ballot. Those are the kinds of restrictive um, uh, you know, barriers that make it harder for people to vote. And so what the John Lewis Voting Rights Act of 2020 would do is it would give a new section four. It would institute a new section four that is a modern day formula to determine which states are required therefore to have preclearance. And it's my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, when Supreme Court struck down section four in Shelby v. Holder, they, they advised Congress to go back and- Absolutely, and advise they gave a charge to Congress to go back and come up with a modern day formula. And so working with uh, you know, lots of voting rights and civil rights activists across this country. Uh, I, I spent many hours and I've introduced this bill now for six years. So since the Shelby versus Holder decision, um, HR4 has been the seminal piece of legislation to try to restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. And like I said, you know, 10, 11 states, I mean, a, 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 as every year goes on, you know, some states fall off because it has to be within a 25 year period, these violations had to occur. Um, and I, I believe every state should make it easier uh, for, for people to vote. And we've seen it play out. We've seen it play out in the primaries. Most recently, uh, states like Kentucky closed their polling stations, allowing only one physical location to go vote. Um, and, you, and they would close that one physical location at, you know, at 6 p.m. So you saw in places like Louisville, where there's a large black community, one polling station, the lines were wrapped around. And while many uh, Republicans say that that just shows the voter turnout, no, no, no. What that is, is no one wants to wait five hours to go vote. We should be making it easier. And if you're gonna close, close polling stations, you should provide notification, right? So these are simple ways that Americans, that will improve the access to the ballot box for all Americans. We need to make it easier to vote, not harder. What are people afraid of? People who are American citizens should have the right when they reach 18 to register to vote, we should make it easier. Why not automatic registration? Now, I don't go that far in this bill, but frankly, as uh, President Obama was saying at John's funeral, John didn't want us to just restore the Voting Rights Act. John wanted us to advance it. He wanted it to make it easier for us to participate in our democracy. And what is the best way we can participate in our democracy? Vote. We have a question from uh, Latoya again, and it, it actually deals with our with our next topic. Um, we are in recent news. There are articles documenting that Selma residents are in opposition of renaming the Edmund Pettus Bridge in honor of John Lewis. Why do you believe this is happening, and do you support renaming the bridge even if it isn't named after Lewis? Great question, Latoya. You know, those of us who grew up in Selma, Alabama, understand the very complicated history that is Selma. Uh, we've grown up with civil rights and civil war living side by side, because after all, the city of Selma was for one day the cradle of the Confederacy, right, before they moved it to Montgomery and then on to Richmond. But um, so Selma, every year we would grow up uh, in March reenacting the bridge and then in April, the Battle of Selma. So I think that what you see is that folks in Selma believe no one should determine the name of that bridge other than people who are from Selma. And I agree with them. You know, at the end of the day, it is a state bridge. I personally, like John Lewis, um, you know, really felt that what happened on that bridge transcends the name of that bridge. But I also believe that in this moment, in this moment, 
where we see people taking down Confederate um, uh, statute, where we see movement by cities and states to rename uh, these Confederate monuments, which let's just face it, they're offensive to African Americans. To um, you know, one can't, one has to be unequivocal in this moment. One can't say that one Confederate naming is okay on the bridge, but all the others are not. One has to be unequivocal. And so in this moment, I think that all Confederate namings should be under consideration. And I truly believe that the people of Selma and Dallas County should have the biggest vote. Now, I personally, as a citizen of Selma, not just representing Selma, I get a vote and I would vote to rename it the John Robert Lewis Memorial Bridge. But I'm one vote. And I think that this is very complicated. John himself will be the first to tell you that he was not the only one on that bridge uh, March 7th, 1965. There were 600 marchers and there were lots of folks bludgeoned. And if you ask folks in Selma who are, are, are foot soldiers, lots of them believe that it shouldn't be named by one, after one person. Um, and many of them, many of them truly believe that what's that we can't live in revisionist history that what makes the Edmund Pettus bridge so special is that people know it for the movement that occurred on it not because of its name and in so many ways it was sweet poetic justice but I want to agree with as my little niece said to me um, when um, we see all around us the movement for Black Lives Matter and Black Lives do matter and if they do matter you have to be unequivocal about us uh, namings of Confederate soldiers, which were meant uh, to glorify um, white supremacy. That's what it was. It was meant to intimidate. If you look at the history of how these namings came about and when they came about right after Reconstruction, um, they were meant to intimidate African-Americans and to glorify white supremacy. That has no place in modern day America. And if we, the people, are truly going to be striving towards a more perfect union. We have to acknowledge the hurt. Those those monuments deserve to be in museums, not uh, not on the streets of America. There have been similar proposals to maybe rename the bridge after the Courageous Eight, or Jimmy Lee Jackson, or even the Freedom Bridge. Um, if it were put to a vote by the people of Selma, you know, sh should it be John Lewis Bridge? or Edmund Pettus Bridge? Should it be op up and open for discussion? How, sh how should the process be handled, do you think? I think it should be open for discussion. Look, I think that, you know, I've told my colleagues up here, um, people in Selma need you to invest in Selma. Like, um, if you really wanna help uh, Selma and help preserve John Lewis's legacy, while namings uh, and symbols are very powerful, investing in the city of Selma to make sure that there is a bridge to come and visit, whatever the name is, is how you uh, really live up to the ideals of John and the and the, the beloved community. The city of Selma ha needs help. And so I, um, I submitted to my colleagues three projects that we're working on for Selma um, that could be fully funded tomorrow if they would uh, give us earmarks back. Um, and they could really be helpful. Everything from providing economic revitalization by really putting the Selma Interpretive Center that the National Park Service runs, making it a state-of-the-art voting rights museum where people can come to Selma and not just walk across that bridge, but spend time and spend money in Selma. Um, there's a housing uh, uh, um, public housing uh, proposal before them. There's a federal courthouse that needs to be renovated. And there's so many um, economic opportunities that we could do to provide real uh, investments in my hometown. And that would truly be in line with the legacy of John Lewis. Um, so look, I think that this is uh, an ongoing debate. Um, you know, these national petitions you know, it's a state bridge. And I do believe that the citizens of Selma and Dallas County should get the largest say and that um, there should be a convening and a meeting of the minds. I don't think that you can have um, it decided by one person, let alone me. I'm a federal representative, but I get a vote because I'm, I'm a citizen of Selma. And uh, so I, I think that it's, um, I think that this moment requires us to look at all of these Confederate namings. In fact, 
I just uh, passed, we just passed the uh, National Defense Authorization Bill, and in it, it gives the Department of Defense three years to rename those Confederate ba those bases that are named after Confederate generals. And that was bipartisan members of Congress voting for a defense authorization bill. If yeah. we can do that, that means all of these Confederate namings and these statutes should be under consideration, serious consideration, and those communities should decide um, what should happen to them. Was there any indication um, for Congressman Lewis passed how he felt about the discussion to rename the bridge? I mean, if he had a vote, how would he vote? Do you know? You no, know, uh, five years ago, he and I co-authored uh, an op-ed in which we um, said that we thought um, that the, um, the, the, the bridge, given its worldwide uh, marketing for a little city like Selma to have such an iconic thing that's known worldwide and um, and John, you know, saying that you can't have revisionist history. Um, that was five years ago. Uh, but one of the last conversations that I had with John and his staff was about how things have changed and how the Black Lives Matter movement and what we were seeing, the social unrest and the fight for equity uh, on the streets of America, um, not just in law enforcement and with police brutality. Clearly, it started that way, but really understanding and believing that Black Lives Matter, then all of these Confederate namings must be under consideration. And John would never stop standing in the way of the will of the people. Uh, I think I can truly say that. And I just want to bring this back to how we started, which is about John Lewis. And I just think that, um, you know, when I think about my pinch me moments or the or the times that I will remember most about John, it is going to it's going to be his humility. It is his unwavering belief that the brighter days are ahead for this nation. He truly believed that. And even yesterday, as I was attending his funeral, he released an op-ed um, that he drafted before he died, was released yesterday by the New York Times, in which he told us, America has to live up to its ideals of equality and freedom, and that every generation has to fight for the progress that has been made and advance it even further. So my challenge to all that, um, all of us is that we can all do with walking a little bit closer to the John Lewis philosophy and remember um, that, you know, all of us have a, a real civic duty, a moral obligation, John would say, that when we see something that is unjust and unfair, John would say, do something about it. Never give up, never give in, but know that you have a, a power, the power from within to do something to fight injustice. That we don't have to wait for, uh, you know, Congress to do it. That we uh, that we all have it within us, the courage within us, that when we see unjust things happening, to say something and to do something. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, that's going to wrap our time here today. I do want to remind you, if you are watching and you have not yet subscribed to the Reckon Interview podcast, please do so wherever you get your podcasts. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be diving deep into some of these issues like voting rights and a lot of the other issues that conversations in the South are driving right now and will shape the 2020 election cycle and, and the future of the country. So thank you very much. And thank you again, Representative. Thank you.